Good evening. Welcome. Uh, you change Spotlight on MX24. On Spotlight, we bring you relevant conversations with knowledgeable minds. Tonight, we are discussing security around elections, before, during, and after elections. On the seats with me today, I have knowledgeable people to go into the issues with us. If you're watching, if you have security concerns, if you have any inputs, uh, join us on all social media. MX24GH, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere, and leave us your concerns. We'll be reading them here live. We'll also be opening the phone lines later. I'm going to introduce you to our panelists, but before we do that, we'll go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, I'll introduce you to them. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuned into MX24. This is Spotlight, the current affairs edition. I am Nuong Falong, and I bring you the current affairs edition of Spotlight Mondays and Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m., running until 9.30 p.m. I mentioned I have in the studio with me uh, Adib Sani. He's a security analyst. He's also uh, the CEO for... Jatike Center for Human Security and Peace Building. Did I get it right? The executive director. For Jatike. Exactly. Okay. But you got it right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I also have Adam Bona, who Adib calls his, his senior. Uh, he's also a security analyst. He has over 20 years of experience in this field. He is also the CEO of Security Warehouse. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so we're discussing security issues uh, during election, before elections, and after elections. And usually, Ghana is a bit of a safe spot when we talk about election disturbances. But in the last few months, we've had a few incidences that have caused a lot of concern among people. Very recently, we've had the Ododo Diodo uh, clashes between NPP and NDC youth. We've also had the attack at the Asawasi constituency, which was carried out by some youth uh, on a police station. Earlier this year, around May, uh, Ghana's security was, was, was pegged at 47 point something. Um, and this is usually a poll that is done, a report that is compiled for travelers. And that's where we were put, around 47%. When we look at these recent disturbances, do we have anything to worry about? 
Uh, also, don't forget, we've had a general security issues with the medal of Professor Bene. We've also had the medal of the Infantiman MP. Should we be worried or are we running ahead of ourselves? Adam, I want you to start with us. Thank you very much and uh, good evening to your viewers. It's my first time coming here. Well, welcome. Yes. And, we'll be uh, having you a lot more. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then good evening to my colleague, uh, Adib Sani. Yes, uh, we, should, we, sh we, we have every reason to be concerned when it comes to the security of this country. Why? Uh, the why, I believe, will definitely go, I will go in there. I'm sure my colleague would also do. Uh, repeatedly, some of us have mentioned that the soul of every security is it intelligence. And so if the soul of uh, a certain sector is non-existent. Uh, when you say non-existent? When I say intelligence, you. when I say intelligence, uh, if you look at the secessionist, you know, movements and the chaos and taking over police stations and kidnapping police officers and breaking into armories, if you look at Odododio, you know, disturbances, if you look at Professor Benny, you mentioned that, Ahmed Swali, if you look at uh, the list is on ending, the highway robberies, it's become uh, every day you have, it's no longer news. If you get to a point in your security where the media is no longer talking about robberies or crimes that are committed, then you know you have a real problem. It looks like that is where we've got into. So I can bet you that if there was a highway robbery, let's say an unfortunate situation on the Kumasi, Accra Kumasi Highway, uh, you will realize that few media houses might report it. And the simple reason is that uh, there are so many... It's not, it's not nothing strange. Yeah, it's, it there are so, so many, many serious issues happening in the security sector. So much so that the media has become very uh, comfortable picking and choosing what needs to be reported. So you have to be a certain uh, MP who would have been killed for that to become news. But if that, uh, you know, tomato seller or trader who goes to Navrongo to go buy tomatoes, on her way she gets robbed. So you're saying there are a lot of these things that fall off our radar because they are, the high profile ones are taking our attention. Exactly. And so that's why I said the soul of every security is its intelligence sector. And that sector to me, and I believe that we've all raised it, it's, it's really not in existence. And so if you look at it, you need the national security, the BNI, and the other sectors to work in a manner that they would pick intel, share the intel, if it has to do with some invading force that is coming from either our northern or southern borders, then you send the military. Mm -hmm. If you need the power troopers to go in, so they will determine the kind of uh, you know, logistics you need, human and all that you need. Depending on what issue it but is and where it is. Most of these things happen and we are reactionary. And so you see all the do 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 who would have thought that, uh, you know, we will be, I mean, I'm not surprised because then the sitting MP recently was in the news for getting, he said he's been beaten. And one was, I was expecting the sector to say, from a certain point to a certain point, no political rallies in that community, no mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. route march, no whatever they call them. They go on what? Peace walk. Mm -hmm. No, nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's certain gatherings. Nothing to instigate yes. any this. But once they looked on, and you can see police. So we officers. had this coming. There was a precedence. Exactly. And this is not, they, they have about 4,000 4, and something, 4,000 something hotspots that have been identified. What are we doing? If we have enough intel, by now they would have told us that this is what they are doing. Some of it, not everything. We don't expect, I don't think the general public needs to know mm, everything. Mm. But I can tell you that even those of us who work with the sector, some of us work with them, in, I mean, so deep. Sometimes you think the guy is in charge. You get to him, say, Master, what is going on? And he tells you, Master. I should be asking Mr. Adam. I thought you were bringing me information. Why, why, why do we have, you know, I will come back to the hotspots that were mentioned. Because I remember the police put out some 600 places. No, but more than 600. 4,000 something. 
Oh, right? I think six six hundred were highlighted. Now, but now it's been revised about six thousand. It, it's oh, four thousand six hundred and something yeah. or so. And Names it's been re that were uh, put out. Yes, areas. So you mentioned that. Uh, our security intelligence, in fact, you said the soul of our security intelligence is non-existent. That's a profound statement. Uh, my question here is with why? Why is it non-existent? Uh, we have politicized it. We've bastardized it. You see, security per se is, is a career. So that's why they say a soldier always a soldier, a policeman always a policeman. If, if, if you are, uh, let's say you, have, you were picked up, I mean, uh, obviously, I am much older than my younger brother <laughs> here. And so let's say my younger brother would have, if he, to help you with policy. And then you come in and say, this is my policy. My policy is this, my policy is that. Then we are somehow uh, bastardizing and, you know, destroying the security architecture. And if you look at the 1992 constitution, I say, uh, 19, 1992 constitution, I call it a 419 from constitution. <laughs> because then... The 1992 Constitution has made the president at every given point like uh, a god, a tin god on earth. He can decide to say this road closed and nobody can say anything. And so the president literally appoints a cleaner to uh, the yes, highest person. Yes, and he can, decide to, he can decide to disappoint all of them. Take the security architecture from uh, who, who are in charge of the district security architecture, who are in charge of the regions, who are in charge of the municipals. It is politicians. You are telling me that during election day, the EC, sorry, the DC is contesting uh, the sitting MP. Hmm. And the DC is in charge of DICEC. And the DC must chair the district security council. And there is confrontation. Who directs? You're already, already polarized. You, because you, yes, yes, you, you have have been your compromised. Yes, you have and these are the challenges we have as a people with regards to. So until some of these things are done, we will go around in circles. And, but one would have expected at least we would find a middle ground and say those who are appointed should allow the technocrats to do their work. But those who are appointed sometime for political expediency's sake will look elsewhere while the crime is committed. Uh, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Before that, uh, Adib, um, why is it that during elections is when we have a spike in these disturbances? Because generally, we have issues with security. But towards election, there's always an increase. What causes? Well, um, let me first of all state unequivocally that crime has been on the increase in Ghana since 2017. As a matter of fact, when uh, the current president was elected, one of the first appointments was the National Security Minister in line with the Security and Intelligence Agencies Act. So, I mean, I was ex extremely happy because that indicated uh, the seriousness he has so far as security is concerned. Unfortunately, um, that is what happens when you try to force a square peg into a round hole. Uh, we have a national security minister who is an accountant and who, has, who doesn't have that third eye. And so that is why we're here today. You, Unfortunately, you say the national security minister doesn't have what it takes to run the ministry. He, he doesn't have that he, third he's eye. He's proving not to have it. I mean, beyond reasonable doubt. Um, that, I mean, on several occasions, I have called for him to resign, not based Has on emotions. Has he done emotions. any specific things that have made you form this opinion? Yes, because uh, like my <laughs> big brother has stated, a lot of the issues we have currently has got to do with intelligence failure. And when you look at his responsibilities in the Security and Intelligence Agencies Act 526, which, as a matter of fact, has been amended into 10-30-2020, um, he is the, so to speak, general overseer yeah. of the various Security and Intelligence Agencies Act. And a lot of the issues, like the Western Togolanders, which was so pervasive for all to see, yet we went to sleep, uh, this Odo do and a whole lot of other is issues of insecurity in the country, has got to do with, uh, with intelligence failure. And as taxpayers, you and I, have the right to hold public officers to account for certain inefficiencies. And it is high time in the spirit of democracy, rule of law, um, public officers also take responsibilities when they go wrong. But back to your issue, okay, 
it is the, the issue of insecurity when it is election time is as a result of the way we do politics in the country. In fact, okay. it represents everything that is wrong with politics beyond even Ghana in the whole you know, uh, African continent. Um, we have issues with uh, zero-sum politics where the winner takes winner it takes all, all and the loser has nothing. So it has become so more like is a fighting to take. Yeah. It, is, it has become a fight for survival, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. It's either I win or I win. It is a do or yeah. die affair. Yeah. Um, secondly, we have issues of the culture of impunity, which is festering in the country, uh, which we are all feeding into. Um, by virtue of your political inclinations, um, your clout in society, you do the wrong thing, you left off the hook, nobody does anything about it. We're all in this country when a group of young men besieged the court premises, released their own, what yes, became yes. of the issue? We're all in this country after the election, young men besieged the Tema side of the toll booth, and according to a police spokeswoman for the Tema area, in her words, because of the politically dicey nature of the issue, we, we cannot do much. So we have a serious issue with the culture of impunity. My senior colleague has already mentioned the issue concerning the current sitting MP mm. at uh, Ododododio, who allegedly was slapped in front of the Jamestown police station. Before the disturbance. Before the disturbance. What, came, what, what became of it? So it is a major issue. Now we're also dealing with the issues of vigilantism. You know, and if you take a closer look at the current trend, you would realize that in the past, the, there's an inverse, as a matter of fact, inverse relationship between the vigilante groups and the politicians. In the past, the politicians gave power to the vigilante groups. When they are uh, 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 arrested, the politicians call the police commanders and tell them, these are my boys, let them go. But guess what? Guess what? Today, the vigilante groups, they give power to the politicians. Yeah. But, but now we have the vigilante law. So, can, we still, can we still say that reasonably vigilantism is still a problem? Because we have a law that's supposed to imprison uh, all such acts. For, for crying out loud, <laughs> we didn't even need the law in the first place. Because Why? We already have the laws, the structures. Do we need a new law to tell us besieging a toll booth is a crime? Do we need a new law to tell us besieging a court premises is a crime? Please. I mean, that's just a shroud, okay? And it's not, it's not going anywhere beyond the paper because the political parties, after going to Pejuasi back and forth, appending their signature to documents at the behest of the Ghana Police Service, the Peace Council, and so many other stakeholders, affirmed their commitment to disbanding the groups. Guess what? None of them has disbanded any group. Are you saying that we cannot have much hope in the ability of the law to insulate us from vigilantism going into 2020? Absolutely not. Because there's still an issue with the culture of impunity in the country. Mm. So all of this is what is amounting to increasing... In fact, I was on a network this morning. A caller said... He just acquired a, a, a pump action, and he's keeping it to protect himself. So, so what's the use of the law? Well, um, <laughs> so, okay, maybe my senior colleague would take I, 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 I think, you see, uh, the use of the law was to, 15 make, years was in, to, in make, us, if, was to make us believe something was being done. So, and from, from, I mean, from the look of things, that's the way it looked. Because then you know when this Ayawa Subruhaha happened. That law, I call mm. it Ayawa So West so Wagon, West Wagon. Wagon uh, Law, <laughs> which uh, until you deal with the challenges that confronted the Ayawa West Wagon, that law will continue to be uh, a bogus law. I call it a bogus law. Because then those who committed the atrocities are still working free. Those who were uh, probably beaten and maimed and shot at, no compensation has been paid to them. Most of the recommendations by the commission was shredded. If I, I wrote GC O level and A level, if you tell me, if you set a question and you say I deviated, at least let me write November, December. If I wrote <laughs> in the, in the normal, the, the, let, me, let me do remedials. Or what I'm saying, yes, let me do, but so we were told that the terms and reference given to these people, they deviated from what they were supposed to do. So literally what it meant was that if you are going to pass a law to stop 
uh, you know, to ensure that those who commit this type of crimes are punished. Somebody committed a crime, you suspected. That is why you thought you need to tighten the law. But the law hasn't been used. Were you not, were we not in this country when at the primaries, the recent primaries at the MPP primaries, uh, certain MPs were beaten. The man who championed the law, uh, Banda, what's his name? Ahmed Banda or something. Uh, he's in charge, the, 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 the legal, chairman of the legal committee of parliament. My good friend, can't remember his name. I mean, uh, Abdullah Banda. Abdullah Banda. In his own backyard, he's superintendent over, uh, usually I tease him, he's superintendent over it. And there, yet the law was not used against the guys who came after him. The guys, you saw the guys go into, is it the Offin River or one of the rivers, to slaughter a ram. You saw it, isn't it? To slaughter a ram. Were they not, you know, defiling, what do you call it, the, the water body, and destroying the water body? Even if the vigilantism law didn't exist, one would have thought that they would have broken a certain environment law. None of it was used. And this is a man who made sure that uh, this But I understand the perpetrators were sanctioned, like, who sanctioned by them? the MPP. Is the MPP a law on, on their own? The MPP is not a law on their own. If right. I commit a crime... You, you wanted see, to see them go through the system. You see, a crime, we have... A crime has no color, no color. So if the MPP could have banned them and all that, but the law must bite. So if you commit a, a crime that looks like vigilantism, you, that could be termed as vigilantism, the maximum is about 15, 25 years. 15 I years. 15 years. That's what's in the law. No one, as we speak, no one has been tried. That's quite an indication. So why won't one say it's a bogus law? I call it a bogus law, which, uh, and sometimes it is so because, listen, uh, there are crimes, do 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 comes, and we are going to see more if we are not careful in the upcoming election. What, what makes you say we're going to see more? Is it specific, uh, specific to do 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 or you other areas like the hotspots that have been you see, those of us who work in the sector i believe my brother here will tell you you receive a lot of calls from these young people he goes to buy a gun and he calls you he goes he wants to go and sometimes but do they register these guns see the point is that they call you mostly with the i mean with an animal's number so mm. uh, you even tracing them you need to sometimes work around to see who this person is and either they are lying or it could be true and usually they will call to sometimes threaten some of us that, yeah, we are going to do this thing because they did it to us and he didn't say anything. We are also mm, going to do it to them. So when we do it and they call act. you, uh, we will be listening to you. So tell the people that until they punish these people, ne next week these people are also going to have their campaign. They will see what we will do to them. So it's about, you know, putting the right punishment yes. to the right crime. Because if we have people who are creating all sorts of problems and creating violence, and they are not being sanctioned properly according to the law, then they will be opposing, their opponents will be retaliating. Exactly. And we keep, this keeps going on. You, you saw uh, Odododio. Yes. If you, you review the video, I'm sure you have done that. Mm. There was someone among the NDC, when the stones were coming from the N MPP area, they took, started taking cover. Then somebody said they should charge in the Ghana language. Mm. He said they should charge. Then they started charging on them. Then when they started charging on the MPP youth, then they vacated their, uh, their camp, unfortunately. Mm. I mean, this shouldn't have happened. They shouldn't have confronted one another. And then this, the MPP, the NDC youths, you know, allegedly uh, invaded the place. You know, you saw a whole uh, refrigerator coming from the top. Mm -hmm. This is, this, you know, re retaliatory mentality if things, I mean, those who commit crimes are not punished, we are going to see them. I mean, as for that, no, no, no doubt about that. Right. And, and let me just add to that. Sure. Okay. And all that is happening is amounting to the buildup of lack of confidence yes. mm -hmm. in institutions of the states. Mm -hmm. Because if something like that happens and nothing is done about it, the next time I feel victimized, instead of going to the police, which I know wouldn't do anything about it, I might take certain measures. Which to might also yourself. mean yeah. taking the loss into my own hands. Because right. according to the small, uh, small Arms Commission, on an unprecedented level, more and more Ghanaians are going for weapons. Mm. As a matter of fact, uh, in, on, on their records, there are well over 1.2 million Ghanaians who are armed. Unfortunately, last year, only 40,000 of them renewed. So a lot of them, 
are holding the guns illegally. We have proliferation of small arms and light weapons from other parts of the continent. And we have a fledgling local gun manufacturing industry in Ghana. And this is what is emboldening more and more people into taking the laws into their own hands. In fact, I was even watching, you know, like you mentioned, the video. A young man, a young man holding a pistol. Yeah. And the manner he was firing, mm. was look, firing. the possibility of the bullets and hitting someone. And that guy, I think, hasn't been arrested afterwards. To date. I don't know why. I think he hasn't been arrested. Let's let's get a bit more insight into these disturbances. We have a, a video. Uh, let's take a look at that. Stay here. This is where I'm from. This is where I was born. Back then, everything was fine here. Politics, there wasn't any chaos, and this uh, uh, Ulaba lose. But now, everything changed, and I'm not liking it. Honestly, I'm not liking it. All my friends, especially close friends, you know, people are supporting parties, and now we are all separating now. It's not good, honestly. When you look at the two parties, and you look at the supporters inside, we are all like friends, families, mixed up. We are all together because Damashi in a whole, we do things together. So if today politics is here and it's going to separate us from each other, then it's better we let them do their thing and then we stay, we stay with ourselves. When election comes, this is where you will get the most news. Damashi will hype election in Ghana. But when you come here, you look, look, just look around, look at the structures. You see short, short buildings. See, this is where we take politics very serious. This is where we take it serious. I was standing at the top. Then they were throwing, they were throwing bottles. Have you seen? So I, I was on the top, then they, they were throwing the bottles. But I have to get down. So when I'm getting, getting down, then, then when I reach here, then, then, one, when, then one of them have broken bottles. Then he used to choke me. If you see the video, I'm at the top when Buko Banku was telling them that they should stop what they are doing. Have you seen? Uh, so when I'm coming, have you seen? Buko Banku tell them to stop. Then right now when Buko Banku get down, then they start it again. Then they are, they are throwing the bottles at the top. Then we are, we are like, we are like 16 people there when they are throwing the bottle. So some, some of them jump. But me, I don't want to jump then my leg will be come cripple, obviously. So I want to pass this way. Then, then when I reach here, then they use the broken bottle to chew. Uh, that was a video of some red residents of Ododoyudu uh, describing what happened exactly on the day of the disturbances and some of the injuries that they sustained. You, you, you saw, so mainly this was, um, this is something that has been uh, fomenting for a while uh, as, you know, evidenced by activities that have been recorded in that area. Uh, who should have stopped this peaceful walk? Because this is a hot spot. Why, why are you conducting political activities in a hot spot? Isn't that like courting trouble? Well, uh, I don't know if you want me to. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, it, it is somebody's duty, you know. We, we are not in a headless country. We are in a country that has, you know, you know, they are heads, big men. Big men. <laughs> and so once we are not in a headless country and a headless community, every community would have, you know, MP, DC, MC, regional minister, and somebody, police commander, district, and all that. Mm. So somebody who was able to determine that Ododio is a hotspot should have been able to determine that for the mere fact that, or for the fact that the MP recently allegedly got beaten in the, the, the police station in that community. It means that these people, these young people, they probably uh, don't care breaking the law. Mm. So what do you do? You tighten it a bit. You tell them that we are going to make it a bit uncomfortable for you, so much so that you are not able to commit more atrocities by taking away some of their rights. In communities where there's conflict, they can be curfews. I'm not saying even curfew, but they could have banned there could be a, a ban on processions, on funerals, or political on gatherings. Gatherings, not. I mean, ban on some of. It. I mean, the law allows you know the DC to advise the, uh, you know, to get the regional minister get a letter to the uh, what the, what was the name the interior minister to put place a ban on. Actually, in any case, we are we are in Accra. Right. So in Accra, uh, when uh, Homawo is around the corner. 
they will say ban on drumming and mm -hmm, woe unto mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. if, if you drum. drum. <laughs> if you do, but we're, we're able to uh, pay heed to those. Yes, those you're able traditional to pay rules. Heed. That's what I'm saying. That I sometimes I think we should leave some of these things for our traditional leaders. Because sometimes they're able to do it a bit better. When you talk about instituting certain restrictions on gatherings, uh, political, I would say political activities, uh, does it mean that we should be extending this to the other hotspots? Because these hotspots have been identified. You sh we should determine some hotspots, uh, you know, are not as hot as Ododio. Ododio mm. has always been. I mean, you see, uh, if you, Azuma Box, Azuma Nelson is from that area. Mm -hmm. uh, Bugum Banco is from there. So it is, if you've lived, I grew up literally by the sea. If you grew up by the sea, you understand that if you think you are strong, we go to the seaside, they draw a circle, they put you in, you fight, <laughs> ah, you see, you would fight, 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 fight. Nobody will separate you. When you are tired, if you don't get any injury, you, you are beaten, you get up next time. So you, Depending you, on the heat of the yes. hotspot, is what you're saying, and yes. the precedence, historic events yes. in that spot. What, Asawasi, for example, yes. we've had, you know, and we have actually have a video of that also, the recent uh, attack at the Asawasi police station. Can we please uh, have that? <laughs> a video about the disturbances in Asawasi uh, where some youth besieged the police station and if you listened I mean they were speaking Hausa but you could hear them clearly saying uh, they are they are intimidating our children we won't accept it and so they were there to retaliate in some way I have no idea who they mean who, who is intimidating their children and who exactly their children are perhaps uh, their followers uh, one cannot really tell but this goes back to what you were talking about initially of people not going unpunished for these kind of crimes. So if people go unpunished, maybe someone committed a crime against them, the person went unpunished, or there was something that was not reported, and they decide to take it into their own hands. Yeah. How, how can we stop this? And they're doing it with impunity. Yeah. These people went on Facebook Live. They're not afraid, clearly. Uh, what makes them think that they won't pay for something like this? Okay. <laughs> okay, let me. Adi, do you it. want to speak to this? As a matter of fact, when it happened, I made a call to Asawasi and uh, I, was, I was given, you know, a catalog of uh, activities that culminated into what happened. Mm. According to my source on the ground, a group of NDC boys seated near the Muntakamu Munta Barak base were arrested by the police right. and they were you know handcuffed on the scene and when they asked the police why they were arrested they said allegedly that it was an order from That's above from <laughs> so they took them to the police and the people in that area feel unfairly treated they mm. feel um, there's been an inconsistent application of the law or enforcement of the law because the other guys, in, according to them, have been engaged in a lot of activities that is, you know, uh, uh, affecting That's the peace in that is area. True. Exactly. And so they went to the police to ask for their comrades uh, to be released. After this uh, incident, the police issued a statement 
and uh, said they would deal with them and they should report themselves to uh, the police. I mean, this represents everything that is wrong with um, politics in Ghana. I am not particularly surprised about what is going on. But before we go further, it is important to contextualize what a hotspot is all about. Every police station at the end of the month or on quarterly basis reports crime statistics to uh, the divisional police command, which also reports to the regional, and which is all uh, put together at the national level. So based on those reports, especially that has to do with politics. So depending on the political volatility of, of that the area, area, they are able to name it as um, a hotspot hot or not. Also based on the track record of that re area as well, okay, it's able to inform whether to label it as a hotspot or not. Um, it is not done by the police alone. We have... Um, uh, it is, it is multi-dimensional in nature. Sometimes we have even the Peace Council that is supposed to have peace monitors mm -hmm. monitoring mm -hmm. and perhaps also based on Reporting intelligence. Back, yeah. So I expected that at least knowing full well that this is a volatile area, some security measures could have been put on the ground. Um, like you it mentioned is, initially, uh, depending on the volatility, we can institute some measures to restrict especially political activities in that in area. In that area. Unfortunately, nothing of that nature uh, was done. Um, there was no intelligence. But the thing is, um, we have a public order act. Uh, just recently, I heard Kwesi Ofori, director of operation, talking to some Nigerian youth around Newtown who went on a demonstration that, no, we have laws in Ghana. Before you embark on such an activity, you need to inform the police five days clear. But the question is, to what extent do these political parties who on a random basis can decide to go on a peace walk mm -hmm. or a health mm -hmm. walk respect these laws? Okay, So if they don't respect it, so the police is perhaps not aware, how about intelligence on the ground, knowing how volatile the area is, so we are able to prevent these things from even happening? We'll come back to that shortly. Uh, we are still discussing security, mainly before, during, and after elections. Adib Sani was just telling us about the indices that go into declaring a place a hot spot and how activities should be restricted. We're going to go for a break. When we come back, we'll continue with the indices. Stay with us. No, this is not business as usual. This is a different kind of business. From the global stock market, to our central bank, to insights on insurance and investment, Spotlight is a show for you. Here, we look beyond the numbers. On Spotlight, we'll tell you the complexity behind the figures. On Spotlight, we examine hardcore financial issues. Join me, Philip Nanfuri, on MX24, together with policymakers and experts, as we talk business.
Welcome back. You're still watching MX24. This is Spotlight, the current affairs edition, and I, I am Nuong Falong. We are discussing security before, during, and after elections. You have some security concerns, or you have observed some security breaches, or you have some experience with this, or you simply want to contribute to the discussion. We have our phone lines open, 020-473-8481. Again, 020-473-8481. We also have 055-033-1511. 055-033-1511. Call us and contribute to the discussion. We want to hear from you. You can also leave a message on our Facebook pages across all social media uh, platforms also. Uh, before we went on the break, Adib, you were telling us about the... Uh, kind of indices that go into declaring a place a hot spot. You mentioned police reports over time based on monitoring uh, Track yes, of, of the, the area. What else uh, should we look out for in well, a hot well, spot? What you're doing is, uh, like my senior colleague said, even if you don't know anything about politics <laughs> in Ghana, you would definitely There's know a name that you, about... Yeah. Uh, and it's a name that sticks. Yeah, and especially between these two candidates. It's, it's Kwame Nkrumah's yeah. first seat. I think that is where... Yeah. I see, yes. yes. Wow. And particularly yeah. between Neil and Van der Boer and Neil and <laughs> Banaman. I mean, it's really a major source of worry. And, of course, Asawasi and so many other areas. So I expect that at least... Um, we put some mechanisms in place to prevent some of these clashes from happening. If really these structures existed, the police could have uh, tried to define the routes so they don't clash, okay? Mm. Or even separated the days on which these events are held or even stop it from even happening in the first let, let place. Me, let me cut in for a moment. Uh, we have someone from Kintampo on the line. James. Hello, Hello, James. Hello, madam. Yes, James. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, James. Anyway, I hope you are fine. We are excellent. We are listening. Okay. I want to make small contribution. Go ahead. Or if a uh, suggestion. Please go ahead, James. Uh, the issue is, you see, you media people, eh? uh, I will put the blame on you small. Why? Tell us why. Sometimes, when the police... Uh, do something that I would say will prevent uh, offenders from doing uh, at which go contrary to the law. Mm. It's the same media personnel who lambast the police. In fact, uh, when I go to... Do you have an there, example? He, because I, I, I'm struggling to, to find out. Do, do you have an example? Uh, like what happened at Kumasi, I think, two years ago. There was this incident that police uh, had encounter with armed robbers and shot, I think, mm. three or four. Mm. So when it came online, people were believing that police have done well and other stuff. But later, it came that uh, those people that were shot were not armed robbers. In fact, I would say wherever you see that uh, you go, uh, I don't know how to, how to put it, but... but you but you see, nobody wants us to, to nobody death. wants to kill an innocent person, you know. So if, oh, if they're sure. shot and it comes out that they were innocent people, I mean, even before that, the media has to interrogate whether they are innocent or guilty because it's important to establish their guilt before you meet out crime, uh, punishment to that crime. Uh, what, what, what I want to say is most cases, the police will act and you, the media people, will sit on television and TV and will be judging them wrongly. So you think, what do you want the media to do differently? Sometimes you need to uh, let the police act or work independently. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, as media people. We'll discuss your suggestion. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, there's someone from Tamale on the line. Hello. Good Tomic good from Tamale. Hello. Yes. Um, I think I would like to say a very good evening to your two guys there. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Adam Bona. Okay. And the, madam, you see, the problem in Ghana is uh, the youth, I may say, politicians have failed us. Why, why do you think politicians have failed us? Because they bought the guns for us. You know, all the political parties are saying that they, they are disbanding this, uh, 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 this vigilante group. But they themselves, they know they can't disband them. Have you seen any new vigilante group? 
Even them, they both. Oh, I am an I am a, a invisible force. I am vulnerable. They both of it. If it is not a hidden thing, they they are aware of it. So when you buy a gun for somebody to go and kill a, a different person, remember when they go and hunt the other person tomorrow, they'll come for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> well, someone's blaming the media. Uh, someone's also blaming the politicians. But you know, they say that uh, journalists and politicians are a lot alike. I, 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 I suspect the, the first caller is a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, because he's speaking I, for the police. I, I know. I suspect he's a police officer. Right. The way he spoke. Mm. And uh, yeah, the way he spoke, I stand to be corrected, but I have a strong feeling he's a police officer. And you know, the police, if you work with the police, they don't like media bashing. Cra. They don't like it. Cra, 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 cra. Especially when their names come up. They don't like it. Cra. There's another person, uh, Yakub from Tamale. Yakub. Good evening, madam. And good family. evening. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I'm good to have you. Uh, this issue concerning our Tell us. Yeah. This issue concerning our creating in this country truly is becoming worried to so many of us. Mm. Uh, I'm a member of one of the bigger political parties okay. in Tamale. But to be frank, what is going on, I'm worried. What, what is sometimes, going on? What is going on? Yeah, the crazy and um, violence nature of this country sometimes is, is, is uh, driving some of the youth away from politics. And we need to actually look at it. If not that, years to come, I don't think who have good people to be in politics anymore. So Thank you so much. It's a serious matter that we, we need to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for your opinion. Have Thank a you. wonderful night. You too. <laughs> you know, um, about the uh, media, well, I'm uh, a media practitioner myself. I'm a member of the Ghana Journalist Association. And I understand the intrinsic value of media, especially when yeah. it comes to harnessing our democracy. And unfortunately, even though uh, the media in Ghana has grown over the years and has contributed meaningfully, I must say, to uh, developing. Uh, developing the democracy of the country, but we're still complicit in, to some extent in what is going on. Every time it's extremely expensive, but these days, you see media organizations, because of sensationalism, because of uh, clicks, you know, give their precious airtime to certain politicians who do nothing but sow seeds of discord yes, in and the say, population. Yes, they say a lot of, you know, incite a lot of violence with their exactly. words. Uh, there's Charles from Tamale on the line. Charles, are you still there? Yes, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Let us hear yes. you. Yes, um, for me, in in the aspect on the aspect of the security related issues mm. and violence that are happening i want to make a point that in ghana okay. our problem are the elderly what, what, what have the elders done yes you notice know that all these individuals are from home okay all these persons are, in one way or the other, related to a family. Okay. Now... You think it starts from the family? Children, sorry? You think all these issues start from the family? No. Our family unit is breaking down. There is a whole lot of individuals. Thank you so much. That now, we have people that can get up, mount, uh, what do you call it, put up Roma, uh, mount, do a lot of distraction. Thank you. Thank you so much. At least we got the, the point, although we've, we've lost him on the line. But we, we, his point is that this is all coming from the family unit. Uh, but beyond the family unit, even if the family fails uh, to establish some of these principled behaviors and there's indiscipline, the security forces are still the ones supposed to contain it, don't you think? Well, well, I, I think so, but just that, like my senior colleague stated, we have succeeded in over-politicizing the security agencies. And I'm, I mean, I do understand the kind of pressure that comes their way 
from left, from right, from center, in especially in the discharge of their duties when it has to do with politics. But like I always say, you have to do things with recourse to the Police Service Act mm -hmm. 350, mm -hmm. with recourse to your code of conduct and ethics. But it is unfortunate to note that a lot of these commanders, like for example, divisional commanders have become like constituency youth organizers, yeah. you know, give, give because me a moment. it's so politicized. So we're, we're, we're getting a lot of calls, and, and we appreciate your calls. Uh, however, because of time, we won't be able to take every call. But we want you to continue the conversation on our Facebook page. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're also streaming live on Twitter. So please, uh, ignite the conversation online. Leave us your opinion on, on our Facebook page, and we will continue the conversation online. Thank you so much for, for calling. Uh, continuing with that, I remember initially in your submission, you said something about crime increasing since 2017. Yeah. Is there something peculiar to, to that period between 2017 and now that has caused uh, an increase in crime? I did. Well, um, it's, it's as a result of so many factors. Um, uh, the fact that um, our intelligence has not really been the best uh, since 2017 because a lot of these crimes could have been prevented. We have issues with very porous borders, you know, people coming from all over the subcontinent into the country and engaging in organized crime, which I must say has become much more sophisticated than we fathom. Uh, there are issues of the training regime for law enforcement, which I must say has also not been the best. In security studies, we say because of new issues, now we're dealing with religious fundamentalism, mm. with new actors, new interests. Uh, now we're dealing with state, non-state, sub-state actors. Uh, because of new weapons, now rape is a weapon of crime. Now water mm. is a weapon of crime. Crime is changing by the day. Yesterday's insecurity is not as today. So you don't expect to train officers five years ago and expect them to counter today's threat because it is changing. As a result, a lot of these criminals are always a step ahead of law enforcement, which gingers them, which gives them the encouragement to commit the crime. All this is also uh, uh, within what we call in security studies situational crime prevention. We have failed over the years to invest in situational crime prevention, which is hinged around a theory called Rational choice. Before anyone commits a crime, the person is human. He has the ability to juxtapose the risk factors against the reward factors. If the risk factors, including the possibility of him getting caught, is high, the person is disincentivized from even committing the crime in the first place. But when the reward factors, which I must say is, is so much, mm -hmm. because in Ghana, the probability that you'll be left off the hook if you commit a crime is very high, considering the number of Cases that is before the police, including the high-profile cases that is not making any headway. All of these encourages the criminals to uh, uh, engage in their practices. So if I hear you correctly, you're saying that uh, the, the crime and the criminals have gotten more complex than the systems that we have to fight the crime. Exactly. And so. we should be working towards investing in prevention. Yes. Rather than, I don't know. Reactive. I mean, yeah. Even the reactive, are we reacting if, if, if The prevention can include modernizing crime and investigation. Most of the processes, what do you mean by, by most of the processes in investigating crime is manual. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, you go report to the police, they don't even have a vehicle to take you to the crime scene. I have, you have a, a to look, personal experience with that. <laughs> you have to look for a taxi. Uh, someone commits a crime in Tamale. Yes. He's arrested. He's released. He comes to Accra, commits the same crime. He's arrested. The police will not be able to tell. If I'm wrong, correct me, yes, senior, yes, that correct. this same person committed uh, the, the act in Tamale because we don't use systems yes. like biometric Very manual, systems. Yeah. And we have a lot of biometric uh, uh, and we databases. we have ICC, you know, development have, these days. Exactly. So. We have the NIE, the NHIE, we have the passport office, SNIT, even the recent... Uh, voter registration exercise is biometric. Why don't we integrate these systems, these systems and under strict conditions with some few legis changes in legislations, make it available to law enforcement. So when they go to the crime scene, at least they're able to harvest fingerprints and run it in the uh, system. And trust me, it's going to do magic, as especially uh, But in, we've been in talking about automation for so long. You know, it's a bit... Uh, worrying that we are still discussing automating the systems now adam i want you to uh someone would say that in previous years 
in Ghana, heading into elections, we always see all these peace campaigns. People, you know, encouraging people to be peaceful and all of that. We've not seen much of that this year. Does it mean that our democracy has matured? Does it mean that this year's uh, election is going to be more peaceful? What uh, is the significance here? I think the, I think it's the state of hopelessness. Oh. Yes, it's rather the other way around. It's so much so that or they, 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 they went on a peace march. They said the it was peace a march resulted in, in clashes. Wow. Thank you. And so in the past, you would have had, you know, religious bodies, you know, organizing peace, whatever. And also the financing agencies, mm -hmm. those who would have to go for money for, what do you call it, to be able to organize this. And because of COVID, wouldn't get those resources. And so, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the reasons why we are not seeing a it's lot more down. of these mm. uh, campaigns as we would have seen, as we saw in the previous years. So, uh, the NCC, we know the NCC was giving some vehicles. Uh, you know, they were giving some vehicles by another state agency, and looks like largely all the vehicles have been collected from them. At the time when we needed the NCC the most, it was given to them uh, during the COVID era to be able to sensitize Ghanaians. Mm. And one was expecting that the NCC would have been given uh, a lot more resources or permanent vehicles. But unfortunately, these vehicles were given to them and some of it, uh, largely a lot of them collected. And so we are at a point where the NCC, NCC is supposed to be educating Ghanaians sensitizing them and joining other organizations to organize these campaigns, they don't have the resource. And so then it's left with probably you, the media, and probably those of us who would be able to join you mm -hmm. to discuss some of these things and tell the young people that uh, don't go and die for any politician because if you die, even when a politician dies, uh, they still go to parliament and do their yeah, yeah. yeah. And so if you die, Mm -hmm. uh, chances are that you will not even be recognized. Okay, and so as far as I'm concerned, the young people who are listening to us, don't allow any politician to lure you into uh, the act of vandalism, you know, but killing one another. some of them need another. the money, some of them are unemployed, and you know, when they give them a little bit of incentive, they, they go and do it. Well, it is true, but I do believe that the more we sensitize people, you will realize that your life is worth more than, you know, the 20 CDs, 100 CDs they'll give it to you, and some you know bottle of beer because if you look at what happened there was so much beer so much so that they threw beer bottles it's, it's possible some of them were even drunk yes true beer so bottles alcohol. at one another and so you see what the politicians are doing to the young people of today uh, the young people i think that we we are told the young people are the future but i say the young people are today because if there is no today they cannot be the future and we are destroying the young people today. So how dare do we say, oh, they are the future? Instead of saying they are today. Right they were now. giving drinks, and I'm sure maybe they might have laced this drink with uh, tramadol and whatever, you know, to get them to, 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 mm. to get into some of this uh, violent confrontation. So as far as I'm concerned, I want to see a paradigm shift where these young people, their energies are rechanneled into more useful, productive, productive, more productive activities. You know, ventures. They should believe in themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. And at this juncture, uh, we have exhausted our one hour. I want to thank you. We've been speaking with Adib Sani. He's a security analyst. We've also been speaking with Adam Buna, uh, another security analyst. We've had some very uh, in-depth opinions here today. And the whole purpose of the conversation was to ensure that at the end of the day, you and I have a lot more knowledge or a bit more knowledge about the security situation and uh, what to do going forward. Uh, I hope that you were able to learn something from today's sitting. My name is Nuong Falong. This is Spotlight. We'll be with you again uh, Monday, same time, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. In the meantime, go to our Facebook page, uh, Gan, uh, MX24GH on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram. Continue the conversation. We'll see you next week. Have a good evening.
U.S., I'm feeling very frustrated in the world in Sambula. I'm very happy. If you don't understand, don't worry, call me self. I don't understand. In this addition, Vodafone Ghana has now made it possible to send money from Vodafone Cash to all network free. We will cross over to our senior reporter for more details. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing in front of downtown. You know, uh, oh, I'm learning to yet make a block. I'm all funny, I just said. Vodafone, I'm all quiet. What do you mean? I'm to be a Emily I got all the network. I will check up there. Me to see Montezo. They are all fucking. Fifia, my tendo says, don't let your good charges, man. No, me. Two, you bro, charges on your womb low. I don't have one. You, I be a rich says, don't have charges or clung. I'm not going to be a friend.